So thank you all for uh, joining the remainder of this session. We have two more uh, talks. So the next, uh, in the first one, uh, we uh, heard uh, what we can learn from the term structure uh, about expectations about the distribution. Uh, in this uh, next uh, talk, we are going to uh, hear what we can learn from historical data, from historical returns, and in particular from taking averages of uh, returns over a, a long uh, uh, history uh, about expected returns, about expected returns in the uh, future. Um, and uh, this comes with a twist, the twist of the survivorship uh, bias. Um, so I guess a good way to explain this uh, is to refer to something my ancestors, the ancient Greeks, uh, used to say, that medical doctors, uh, they used to say, are very lucky people because their successes are seen by all, but their biggest failures are not. Um, so here is the issue of uh, focusing on survivors of successful markets and assets and the problems this uh, introduces. So. Our uh, speaker is a person eminently qualified to talk uh, about these matters, uh, Professor Herd Rauenhorst, uh, who is the Robert and Candice Haas Professor of Corporate Finance at uh, Yale University. Professor. Thank you very much. Um, first, I would like to uh, thank um, for the, thanks, say thanks for the opportunity to be at this wonderful event to uh, honor uh, Steve. Um, St I was not one of Steve's students, uh, but uh, Steve uh, hired me uh, at Yale University. And I do remember as I was trying to make up uh, my, my mind about you know, which university, which of my job market offers I was going to accept, that my advisor said to me, um, there's no question you should go to Yale. Uh, because he said, you know, you could get to have lunch with Steve Ross. And uh, I didn't, you know, of course I had met Steve, and, uh, and my, my advisor described it this way. He said, you know, having lunch with Steve Ross once a month is worth more than uh, having lunch every day with the faculty of University X, which I will not, will I, which I will not mention. Of course, um, University X is none of the universities that you belong to, of course. It was, uh, it's outside with that set. But I, I think um, it's been really a wonderful uh, 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 opportunity to be at Yale, and, and certainly Steve has been a wonderful mentor and, um, and also a, uh, a great friend. So, um, so what do market prices tell us? And I'm going to take a long-term view. Um, I'm, I'll start off with equity markets, but I'll want to look, as you'll see in a minute, also at some other uh, uh, assets. And um, I'm going to tie it to... Uh, important uh, research that Steve has done on uh, the survivorship bias. So let me just start off by um, sort of asking a very simple question, which is, you know, what is the expected return on the market? And of course, uh, the answer to that question is, has obvious, you know, practical implications and is important in, in many contexts. And the problem with trying to estimate expected returns is, of course, they're not really observable. and uh, and and given the fact that markets are, can be very volatile, uh, one often has to resort to historical data and very long time series to get uh, a, a reasonably accurate uh, estimates of at least what, uh, what average returns were uh, in, in history. So it's not uncommon in equity markets to collect you know, data back for 100 years and use the you know, 100-year averages as a starting point for thinking about what expected returns might be uh, going forward. So for example, uh, the, in the equity, on the equity risk premium, uh, it's very common that people go back to 1926 and estimate how much equities have earned in the United States over the risk-free rate and use that as sort of a baseline uh, uh, expectation about what investors might uh, uh, expect to return going forward. So the equity risk premium, the number between 6 and 7% is 
is basically comes from taking historical averages over 100 years. And of course, you know, investors have actually, so researchers have gone back even uh, further than that in order to get even you know, more accurate estimates of that long-term average. So th the contribution that you know, Steve made in a paper with uh, Steve Brown and Will Getzman was to say, look, there is a, it's, 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 it's very tempting to look at these very long histories, but there is this, there's this danger uh, that you're uh, getting an overestimate of the, of the average return because when you start looking at these long-term time series, you start to look at markets that have survived. And of course, investors, and, and not all markets have survived. If you go back in history, there's actually plenty of markets that have failed. Markets have disappeared altogether. And when you look at these return experiences in those markets, they have been lower than the returns that you and investors experienced. So ex ante, investors should take averages over all these markets uh, uh, going forward, also the markets that fail, because of course, ex ante, we don't really know which markets uh, are going to survive. So one question that I want to pose um, is, you know, does this survivorship bias also um, exist at the asset class level? So is there a possibility, for example, that there is a survivorship bias in equity markets as a whole uh, relative to uh, other in feasible investments uh, if we go back in history. So let me just try to frame it by sort of, let's look at, at publicly traded equities. I think um, we can all sort of disagree exactly about what the date was that uh, this innovation uh, arrived, but it's oftentimes dated around 1600 with the founding of the Dutch East India Company in the Netherlands. So um, that's about 400 years ago. If you look at a recent uh, report by the World Federation of Exchanges, um, it's now estimated that there's probably 44,000 uh, know, uh, stocks traded on 59, or 58 or 59 international markets worldwide with a market capitalization that exceeds the $60 trillion. So in many ways, right, so publicly traded equities have been an enormous success over the past 400 years. It was a very powerful and important uh, innovation. But if you ask yourself, so let's, let's see what the world looked like sort of halfway this 400 year period. So um, I happen to have in my possession a copy of a price list of the Amsterdam market where the Dutch East India Company traded from 1810. And so this is a bi-weekly um, publication uh, that lists all the important securities that were traded in Amsterdam at the time. There's a backside to this document, but at least essentially currencies. These are the securities that investors uh, uh, had an interest in. So for those of you who have difficulty you know, reading Dutch sideways, I kind of color-coded the blocks to indicate you know, what's, what's, uh, what was on the market. And you see you know, most of it, uh, the largest asset class was domestic bonds. There were also uh, international bonds traded in Amsterdam. And there was a, a fairly large section of uh, lively market in mutual funds. I'll talk a little bit more about mutual funds later. Much of what these mutual funds did was they traded on the fortunes of the United States, basically, essentially on Hamilton's plan to try to uh, uh, consolidate the debt that was uh, accumulated during the Revolutionary War that you know, was what, uh, and there was speculation about whether this debt would ultimately be redeemed at par or not. And these Dutch mutual funds were set up to take advantage of that. So, so they were actually also buying large debt funds. There were also a few other funds that were trying to speculate on real estate in the United States. So the question is, where are the equities? Right, so we're now halfway in our 400 year period, but the equities have essentially disappeared uh, from the market. Right, so what would investors have worried about uh, at, at this time? Well, they're probably worried about interest rates. They probably worry about U.S. defaults. They might worry about real estate prices, about the prospect of war between some of the nations that were in their portfolio, but the equity premium would probably be somewhere near the bottom of the list. So if, um, if publicly traded equity was such a, an important and great innovation. 
right? Why was it so slow to take off? And sort of one reason um, that, I, I think we don't really know the answer to this, but one reason one could entertain is that maybe historically the equity risk premium that investors had earned over the early period of publicly traded equity markets was too low. So actually there's some evidence on that. There's, a, there's some research by Golas and Kautais uh, for the UK and the US who look at equity returns in those markets between 1865 and 1809. And they estimate a risk-free rate and a risk premium that investors would have earned, and they come up with an historical uh, uh, a risk-free rate of about 3%, but an equity risk premium that is well below what we currently you know, use as averages calculated over the last, uh, say, 100 years. So the equity risk premium was below 2%. Another contributing factor, probably, that equities disappeared was there was a South Sea bubble around 17, uh, 1720, which, uh, after which governments made it much more difficult to start publicly traded uh, companies, and uh, so that probably also had contributed to the demise of equity markets. But I think the point here that I'm trying to make is that when we base when we, when we look at historical data and we base our risk premium estimates uh, basically on periods, on histories where markets or asset classes did particularly well, um, it is not, it's not impossible that it creates a survivorship bias at the asset class level, uh, very similar to the survivorship bias that Steve uh, pointed out uh, exists at uh, the country market level. I think the second uh, observation from, from this little exercise is that innovation is very, very slow, right? So it, it, takes a, it takes a long time for these innovations to actually take hold, and the whole process of why innovations take off and why innovations survive or fail is uh, not so well uh, understood. So I think there's some merit for us as a profession to start thinking more about the notion about, this, about what drives survivorships in financial markets. Um, there's actually not that much literature about it in finance. Uh, the literature that exists um, is uh, by and large uh, in, in, in futures markets about why futures contracts survive or why they fail. Um, but, um, and also, of course, it's a very important practical question. I mean, so many practitioners try to come up with new financial products uh, every day, and we see oftentimes that you know, new innovations are being introduced, but then they have somehow, for some reason, they do, not, uh, 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 they do not really take off. So what I will do is um, I'll try to uh, um, so suggest a number of reasons for why it is that uh, innovations fail, and I'll try to show you with some examples of why, whether this, whether these, which of these reasons might be um, sort of the more, the most important ones. Once, once I look at some uh, some actual uh, uh, innovations throughout history. So, in, in a way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to argue to you that that when we look at a time series of return, there's actually a parallel time series. Uh, that sit next to it, which is, I think of, I call it the time series of contracts, right? So we, in, in, we spend a lot of time in finance thinking about the time series of returns and analyze it, but I think we sometimes don't pay enough attention to the time series of contracts, of new asset classes that are being introduced, new financial contracts that are being introduced, and then study the reasons for why these contracts survive or why they fail. Um, there's certainly a literature, an academic literature on optimal contracting, which is uh, how should we design financial contracts. So I think of this, this time series of contracts as the empirical counterpart for testing maybe these theories about uh, why contracts, how we should uh, uh, structure uh, uh, financial contracts in, uh, in practice. So let me, uh, let me go through some innovations. Um, so here's one which um, goes back to 1780 which was an inflation-linked uh, security that was issued by the state of Massachusetts Bay in 1780. So this was a time that, uh, this was during the Revolutionary War, uh, when there was massive inflation in the US. Actually, I'll show you in a minute that uh, 
inflation at the time ran at a, at a, at a clip of around 200% uh, per year at an annual, uh, annualized. And um, it was very difficult to, um, to send an army to war when inflation was so high and wages would be depreciated by inflation for the soldiers. So there was an, there was an, there was an initiative in Massachusetts to pass a law that would freeze prices. So that would basically outlaw inflation. That failed. And so the next thing they did is they say, well, let's, let's design a security that would protect the soldiers against, uh, the, against inflation. And what they did is they paid soldiers with bonds where the principal would be tied to a price index of four commodities. And the commodities are uh, a certain amount of corn, uh, sh beef, sheep's wool, and sole leather. So that was the CPI of you know, 1780, you could think of it that way. Right? So as that, as that price index would go up and down, the, the notional of this payment to the soldier would be adjusted you know, uh, uh, upward or downward. And um, if you actually look at, uh, so there's actually very specific amounts of sole leather and, and corn and, and, uh, and sheep's wool that are in this basket. And when you look at the prices uh, during, during that time, this actually turned out to be an equally weighted portfolio of four commodities. So, um, so I collected the data on this um, for these 44 commodities. Actually, I didn't have um, I didn't have wool, but I could find cotton prices, so I cheated a little bit. But this gives you that. So this bond was issued in 1780, right on the boundary between the blue and the green uh, uh, three-year periods. So if you were standing in 1780 and you look back, you saw that this this index of these for these four commodities had increased at a rate of about 200% per year. And during the holding period of this bond, which was three years, you see that the principal was adjusted at a rate of 44% per year. And, and maybe quite fortunately, just as this bond expired, the war came to an end and inflation disappeared in the US. Right? So I think it was, a, it was a great innovation. It was a great innovation. But after this security paid off, basically it disappeared. And there was not a market for, um, you could call this probably treasury indexed uh, uh, inflation protected securities. There was no tips market in the US and for, for the next 200 years. Um, so why was that the case, right? Why did this innovation that had many of the characteristics of current tips, why did it, and it was a success, it repaid the soldiers, why did it disappear? Did, um, was it not well understood? Um, Maybe, right, maybe there was no, people didn't really think of indexing uh, very much at that time. So, of course, indexing is a big thing today, uh, but people didn't really think much about indexing at that time. Um, probably the best explanation I can come up with is the fact that inflation went away, right? If you actually collect inflation data from the U.S. from between 1800 and you look at the price level in 1930, it turned to be about at the same level as it was in 1800. There was no net inflation over the first 130 years of this, uh, of this 200 year period. And it's partially because the US was on the gold standard, right? It was on the gold standard. So maybe because inflation sort of didn't you know, rear its ugly head, there was really no reason to revive this security. Now, um, since, we're in, since I'm in Germany, um, I realized that, of course, Germany at some point had uh, commodity linked securities. Uh, in 1923, 1924. So here's some examples uh, from the German experience. So these are loans, essentially state loans, that were um, indexed to brown coal, rye, uh, benzene, coke, and coal, so energy and, and commodity-linked loans. Um, my favorite one is, um, is the one that's on the left here, which is a, um, it's actually a it's actually, it's almost like a piece of paper money. It's about this big, and it's uh, linked to, uh, it pays 5% over a certain amount of wood, right? And the wood, it's, the amount of wood, it's, uh, it's part of a fast meter. I'm told that that means it's a, it's, a, it's a cubic meter of wood that's tightly packed, but this is one 400th part of, a, of this cubic meter of wood. So I think that's about a log you put in your fireplace, right? And so this paid like 5% interest over one log of wood. Um, it was issued by the city of Glogau, which now I think is in Poland, but at the time of the issuance was 
uh, in, uh, in Germany. Right. But also in, in Germany, uh, since then, of course, uh, inflation index loans, to my knowledge, uh, have disappeared. Now, I talked to you already a bit about mutual funds, right? So mutual funds, the earliest that I know of, of a mutual fund, um, goes back to um, 1773 uh, in the Netherlands. And um, as you've seen from the price list from 1810, mutual funds became quite, a, quite, a, quite an operation, quite a success, right? It was a, su a substantial subset of the securities that investors cared about in 1810. But mutual funds disappeared subsequently, and they disappeared in the 19th century only to return uh, maybe in the 20th century and really, of course, become a mainstay of uh, everybody's uh, uh, investment portfolio towards the second half of the 20th century. So let me sh show you a bit something about these mutual funds because it's actually puzzling for why it is that these mutual funds disappeared and took so long to come back. So first of all, the, it was a, it was a, a, a closed-down mutual fund that uh, held international bonds. All of these bonds were traded on the Amsterdam market. So investors could buy these bonds freely already in, in Amsterdam. Um, and it held an equally weighted portfolio of these bonds. And in the red box, which is on that, uh, on that share certificate of this mutual fund, it lists exactly what the portfolio was. So it had you know, Danish and Viennese uh, banks. It had um, actually uh, German uh, state bonds from Brunswick and Mecklenburg, the Postal Service of Saxony and so forth. And so it, has a, it, had, a, it had, a, had a fixed portfolio. There was no guessing what the manager would do. Um, and there was a 1% management fee that was written, uh, that was, was, was written down in the prospectus of this, uh, of this mutual fund. So it seemed actually you know, not all that, it seems a bit high if we think about index funds today, but it would certainly not qualify as a, the most expensive fund that you could uh, uh, invest in uh, today. Another, I think, really interesting thing is that the fund actually embedded a lottery. And maybe if I have time, I'll tell you a little bit more about the lottery later. But essentially, these bonds paid a certain amount of interest. And the interest was actually not paid out fully as dividends to the shareholders in this fund. It was actually sort of, they, they built up a little reserve in the fund, and they held a lottery. And one of these shares would be drawn uh, each, each, each year, and then that, that, that investor would get a prize. And all of that, right, this was sort of, this was in intentional building in of, of positive skewness in the payoffs to investors to probably make it more attractive to small investors. So why do I say this is, you know, I think that the whole notion of, of diversification and, you know, principles of modern finance were pretty well understood in Amsterdam in 1776. So this was actually from a prospectus of the second mutual fund. Right? And four, I lift four parts of that prospectus. The first, the prospectus said, he said, let's buy good securities. Well, you can't really disagree with that, right? The second thing they said is, you have to diversify. You should not put all your eggs in one basket, right? That's the second thing. The third thing is, I think was, is, it was interesting, it says diversification is actually really hard to do uh, on your own when you have very little money to invest, right? It's just the notional amounts of, of bonds were just too high for, relative to the wealth of investors to be able to diversify, but here you could buy a share in a portfolio, and so it provided diversification for small investors. And then there's the notion of how does diversification work, right? They basically, the, the, it's, it says in the prospectus, you know, assets are imperfectly correlated and the risk of losing all your money is relatively small. If you thought that that was that everything would stop paying off at the same time, you should not invest, right? So it seems that people understood or certainly tried to create, educate people about you know, how these mutual funds worked. Um, the third mutual fund in 1779 actually took away the fixed portfolio and basically said that they were going to invest in securities that based on a decline in their price, would marry speculation and could be purchased below their intrinsic value. Right? So value investing 
was really something that was sort of in the mind uh, of, uh, of, 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 of portfolio marriages in, 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 in the 18th century. So, so clearly, um, I think people understood how diversification worked at the time, but maybe the, 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 the contracts were poorly designed. I'm sorry, I, uh, I forgot about this slide. I'll, sh I'll show you this, this quote. Right? It says on the front of this prospectus, it says, you know, that, that uh, it, it outlines basically the philosophy of, uh, of value investing. So was the, were these contracts well designed? Well, um, right, one of the things that, you, that, have, that we learned since the financial crisis is that there's Madoff risk, right? And you invest in, uh, in funds, sort of the, pr the principal agent problem. And this principal agent problem was understood in, uh, in the early days because they said, you know, in order to prevent the, the manager to run off with the securities, they would say, this, this is sort of the custodial agreement, they would basically put all the securities of the fund in an iron chest. And the chest would have three locks with differently working keys. And basically the portfolio manager had one and there was two directors of the fund. They had the key to the other lock. So it required three sets of eyes to basically open up the quote unquote, the portfolio in order to, uh, to trade with uh, any of the securities. So, um, so why were mutual funds slow to catch on? Well, um, it seems that initially they were a success. Diversification was understood. They were, they were well designed, they had low cost. They had these embedded lotteries to make them attractive to small investors. But I think eventually what happened is that investors lost money. So in some of the funds, in the international bond funds, they held mortgage-backed securities. I'll talk about these in a minute. And these mortgage-backed securities basically lost their value. And there were also some later mutual funds invested in real estate. It was basically betted on the settlement of uh, the Western settlements in the United States, and they held lands in upstate New York. And these real estate investments, they stopped paying off. And it's when investors start to experience losses and, and poor returns, that's essentially when the, when the new issuances didn't come to the market anymore. So it seems that, that investors experiencing losses might be sort of a powerful deterrent for, uh, for, uh, for, for survival of contracts. So I already, uh, there's a couple more. Um, I've already talked about mortgage-backed securities. Mortgage-backed securities um, go back to uh, the 1700s uh, in, in Amsterdam as well. They were essentially, it was a, there was a big issuance of mortgage-backed securities between 1750 and 1780 in Amsterdam, there were probably 300 issues that basically came to the market at the time. And they were all mer merchant bankers that used to make mortgages to plantations in the West Indies, and then basically used that to uh, establish trade relationships with these plantations to, uh, to uh, sell their products in Amsterdam. So it was really just a dark side in the history of finance. So it was partially used to, uh, to finance the uh, transatlantic slave trade. But the contracts were very sophisticated, right? They were very sophisticated because these prospectuses would say that, you know, we can make mortgages to these, uh, to these plantation owners, but the plantations have to be appraised every other year. There was a loan to value ratio of, of five eight. It was actually all quite sophisticated to protect investors. So why did this disappear? Well, again, it disappeared that Holland got into a war where it lost its colonial possessions. Basically, there were defaults some of these mortgage-backed securities were refinanced into equities, uh, equ equity shares, but ultimately the, the innovation itself uh, disappeared for more than 100 years. Now, um, so finally, two innovations that uh, uh, failed to survive, so they never actually came back. Uh, one is called tontines, and the other are lotteries. Right? So tontines is a form of an annu annuity that's being paid to a group. And the annuity is being divided among the surviving members of a group, right? So if I pay you, I pay a, a big dividend to everybody in the room here. And of course, as, as people start to die, then of course the payouts to the surviving members will go up. 
So it creates a bit of a conflict of interest, sort of when the group gets, <laughs> gets very small, right? And uh, that's actually indeed one of the reasons that probably tontines got outlawed. And right now, if you actually read about, if you Google the word tontine, you get a lot of uh, 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 references to crime novels. Now, uh, it's interesting though that the, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, for example, was financed through tontine. So it was really just more and more recent history that it was outlawed. And then finally, um, lotteries. So I think lotteries is actually a really interesting one. If you look at the portfolios of investors in the, in the, in the 18th century, you would see that securities, and so bonds and, 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 and stocks and mortgage-backed securities and lottery tickets would all sit side by side in an investor's portfolio. So people thought of lottery tickets as essentially, in, in the same way they would think about securities. And of course, the beauty of a lottery ticket is that it requires a relatively small investment, but it has this ability to have a, of a large payoff, right? It's this positive skewness that allows you to maybe, you know, cre uh, create a big leap in wealth that maybe the traditional investments in fixed income uh, don't really offer you. And of course, there were, um, there were also attractive uh, ways to finance uh, investments. For example, Yale um, um, uh, financed some of its buildings through a lottery. Right? So, so, they, so you had a, a Connecticut Hall, which is one of the oldest buildings on the Yale campus, was partially financed by a lottery. And if you think about why that's attractive, is you don't have, there's no debt service, right? You basically sell a bunch of lottery tickets, um, you take in money, you, have a, you, you pay out part, part of, your, of your receipts in form of prizes, and the rest of it you use to fund your investment. And of course, during colonial times in America, there were many investments, things like toll roads and bridges, were effectively financed through lotteries. But these have disappeared probably because they have been monopolized uh, by the governments. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's a, sort of interesting that the Dutch investors, the Dutch, the Dutch uh, um, uh, money managers who set up these mutual funds actually thought purposely to put lottery tickets into diversified investments to make them attractive to smaller investors. And you would think if people are worried about the savings rate or the capital market participation of small investors or, or low income investors, that may be one thing to uh, uh, way to increase that participation or give people an incentive to participate in, 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 in these markets is maybe to attach or to allow people to attach sort of these lottery-like payoffs to uh, when, they, when they issue uh, securities. So what can we learn from financial history? Well, um, I think there's two things, two points that I try to make is, one is, you know, when we think about uh, estimating the average return, uh, what can we expect when history is a guide? I think one of the things I would emphasize is to say we should probably look at all financial contracts that investors could have were available for investment to investors and including those that didn't survive and we cannot even at the asset asset class level we can't just look only at sort of asset classes that became uh, 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 a, a big success and the thing, second is there's a complement to the time series of financial returns that we're all uh, uh, used to studying which is the time series of contracts and I think there are a number of interesting questions that I think we can, we, which are important for us to study as academics, but of, I think have very important practical uh, implications as well, which is you know, what drives financial innovation and what makes financial innovations a success, right? And it's remarkable if you look at history that even so many innovations that we now think as great successes, equities and mutual funds, uh, mortgage-backed securities, basically experienced a very, very slow start and very slow to develop, right? And if you ask yourself, you know, what drives, what failure, what drives failure, I think one of the things that it seems to be a theme throughout history is that when investors earn, experience, you know, poor returns, that seems to be, you know, a big threat towards the continuation and survival uh, of financial contracts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, there is time for a few questions. If there are. The equal weighting in the mutual fund, do they rebalance? 
They, uh, I think this was uh, meant to be uh, a buy and hold situation. Equal weight at the beginning and then just buy and hold. They actually they quantified the number of bonds. They said five bonds of this type, five bonds of that type, five bonds of that, and they're all with face values of a thousand. Something else? Can I ask a question? Yeah. 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 If there were only bonds being traded, who held the equity interest? Were they privately held? Um, the equity interest in the... If in there's a company that issued a bond, yeah. the equity holders are the private equity holders and they're not marketing their equities. I think these were not corporate bonds. All these government all, bonds. These are all government bonds, yeah. Okay, so these I were thought there was this little box that was corporate, but they're all government. They're all government bonds, okay. yeah. The, um, <clears throat> the rise in, in equities coincided with the Industrial Revolution. So you get big conglomerates of capital. This makes me think that agency costs outweighed the benefits of having large conglomerations of capital until the Industrial Revolution made it necessary to, like, to, for, to fund a railroad or something like that. But that gets back to Steve's thing. If, if the agency costs are dominant, then you don't form a, a, a limited liability company, but once you need so much capital in each company, that overweighs the agency problems. You think that makes sense? Yeah, I, I think it's just, that is it's completely plausible. So you'd be saying this at some point when companies you know, b became larger, there was just constraints on the, yeah. Yeah. Early 1800s and that yeah. required the amalgamation of large pools yeah. of capital to fund these enterprises. Yeah. And before that, you know, companies could be fairly small because they're, and that's although, why equities became so popular. Yeah, yeah although of course in the, in the um, you know, even in the 18th century, you had the foundations of insurance companies that were publicly traded, um, both in the UK as well as in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, you had trading companies that, you had trading companies in Spain, Portugal, um, that were publicly traded, and somehow they disappeared. Right, so I think, I think part of the puzzle is, uh, is also, you know, why did the, why did even the, 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 the firms that were formed, why did they disappear? And so I don't, I don't think I have any answers. Um, I think, I think it is striking that when people have tried to calculate the returns on these companies, they were actually, they were not high. No, they had limited liability. What was called stock in, yeah. in, the, in the early 1900s is really preferred stock or income bonds, basically. And you don't, you don't see, limited liability isn't allowed. That's why, why you don't see uh, real common stock out there. So there's a small amount of. I, I believe, though, that, the, um, that the, the, the trading companies, 17th century trading companies, were limited liability companies. So they were not, uh, it wasn't the case that you could get capital calls when you were a shareholder. Well, I, I don't know about other countries, but right. in the US, they weren't allowed. Yeah. So. yeah. Can I ask also, uh, I mean, you talked about uh, case studies, if you like, or examples. Um, is there, do you have a sense of a more uh, sort of unifying principle or theory that governs birth and death of these, of these assets? Because the need to manage those risks exists. It's, uh, um, it's there. Um, and then how come a disappointment with, you know, a financial instrument, you know, leads to its death and then... It, it never comes back or it takes 100 years to come back. Do, do we understand the process at all? So I think this is the, the, this is the point that I raised. I think it is a, it's a completely understudied field by us that we, the time series of contracts and why, why innovations, where do they come from, what is the problem that they're solving and why do they survive and disappear? I think it's just we haven't really made a lot of progress 
on it or we have not, I, at some point I asked, I was interested in why futures contracts fail and I, I contacted the CME and I said, can you send me a list of all the contracts that you've tried in the past and, uh, and what happened to them eventually? And they said, well, yeah, we don't maintain that list, which seemed to be stupendous to me because they're in the business of trying to launch contracts and, and uh, live off their success. There is no institutional memory. We don't know what the expected return on stock is because the volatility of the market is so high, the standard error is so big, even if you take all the data and say that's the whole history, you get a number between one and 10%. <laughs> it's, it's uh, I mean, I think all this history is interesting, but you haven't got a prayer of ever getting a good expected return on, on the market. That's why I always say there's, there's no equity premium puzzle because we don't know what the equity premium is. Right. <laughs> but Gene, that raises another question, why there is such discussion about an equity premium puzzle when as far as I can tell, like you say, there isn't one. We just don't know. We just don't know. I had a question, you know, you're talking about financial innovation and including these and so forth. And I'm just curious because I haven't looked at this historical stuff in this way, but have, has it been well developed how you define what's a new innovation? I mean, you know, I, I perform the same functionality and I change something. Am I, am I really innovating? You know, is that really a lost innovation? Uh, for example, in the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, if you look at where all the trading volume, I forget what they called them, they were basically options. All the stuff, they didn't trade stock. They had stock, but they just didn't trade it. They tr that traded very little. All the trading volume were done in things that we would identify as options. So I'm just, I mean, I'm just giving that as an example. So when you look at this list, how do you decide, you know, when you're trying to go back to this period, whether something is different or the function's the same, but it's just a, a different definition? I mean, you know, because it seems to me from your hypothesis of how you would do that, that'd be fairly important. Yeah. So I think the, think the early shares in the Dutch East India Company, they were essentially traded uh, in a forward market. So the company would open its book once a month and would settle transactions. So you would every, when, you, when you traded before the end of the month, you basically would trade, trade, uh, trade uh, a forward contract on the stock. And as, as you say, these contracts were modified that you could actually get out of it unilaterally, and that sort of gave rise to the options market, but that has to, had more to do with, that it wasn't sort of that, it was sort of more to accommodate continuous trading when the company only tra allowed you transfer once a month. So. I see. Yeah. In, in anything else? Uh, you have a question? Do you know what kind of people, what class of people invested into these um, assets you presented? So, um, I think, I think n no. Uh, although, I mean I, I mean, I don't know it, but I mean, it is known because all these uh, all the, the early stocks were all held in people's name and there was a register uh, maintained by uh, the company of who the shareholders were. And there actually is a whole literature about uh, investors in the Dutch East India Company, and they were mostly they were mostly you know, wealthy families in um, in Amsterdam. Um, although uh, there are uh, examples of small investors as as uh, as, as well. See the contracts that they wrote with the kings when they financed the war, well, the war in another country, <laughs> and how they would guarantee payoffs uh, on those. Enforcement was a problem. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, so, so one one thing that, you know, that we don't actually have any data on is is private equity, right? Of course, there was lots of businesses, you know, around in Europe, in Germany, of course, as well as in Holland, and of course, these were all privately owned assets, so measuring the returns on those types of assets, you know, we have even less of a hope for than the stuff that is exchange listed. <laughs>
So, okay, last, last question up there. Yeah, I, I have, part, I have uh, two part questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, in one of the first slides, uh, you mentioned that government regulations do play a role in it. So I was wondering if you believe that private equity, leverage funds, hedge funds, or any such funds would ever be become a part of the retail investors part because right now it's more or less for the high net worth individuals. And the second question which I had was relating to that if we look at perhaps the whole last few hundred years, a lot of, even today if we take lotteries for instance, there is a part of investments in lotteries in a different form because there are people who trade in options like the investors have a part in the in option trading as well as in equity trading as well as in trading firms and because of that it also becomes difficult to estimate the systematic and unsystematic risk so there is still a flavor of lotteries in our current investment trends as well and the portfolios management as well so so yeah i, I think i i agree um with with your observations um i i didn't get the first question uh, completely but um, perhaps we can talk after the, the next session uh, privately offline. I don't want to sort of embark on uh, steal time from Steve because that's really why we're, why we're all here. So, but thank you very much for your questions. Okay, thank you very much for the excellent question.